Anantananda Ramachan, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sachs. I am grateful uh, to be here and uh, to have the opportunity to share something of the wisdom of the Hindu tradition on this issue of our common deliberation, uh, migrants and, and refugees. I speak at the end of a list of presentations by distinguished representatives of the world's traditions, and uh, I'm in a position to, to say that I affirm so much of what has been said, and being the final speaker, I've had the opportunity to see how much we share and how much we can affirm together. So I have a copy of my presentation. What I will do is just highlight five points that I have made in this presentation very briefly, and uh, you can fill the blanks uh, by reading what I uh, have written. I think the special place of religion in this kind of discussion is that it offers us a ground of ultimate meaning, a ground of ultimate significance and concern to think about uh, this, this issue. So when we think about uh, the issue of refugees from this place of ultimate concern, we're certainly thinking practically and pragmatically, but we're also thinking from a very profound place about the nature of, of reality itself, that which we hold to be, to be true for all, for all times. And this is the, the first point that I want to make. I think in our different ways, we share an understanding of the universe as having its origin and its being in what my tradition speaks of as the real one, the true, in Sanskrit we call it uh, sat, being or Brahman, the infinite one, who is the source of the source, the support, the end, or the goal of all of all existence. And this one uh, in the Hindu tradition is not a national or a tribal deity, the deity of a particular religious or ethnic community, but the source of all life, of all existence. And so we should never assume that our community is favored or privileged by this one above all else, above all others. Because this one is infinite, and the word Sat or Brahman means the infinite one, this one has no boundaries. Our boundaries are not God's boundaries. As important as the affirmation of this one who is the source of all, source sus sustenance and destiny of all existence is the Hindu teaching that this one exists equally and identically in all beings. This is the source of human dignity of human value and fundamental for our, the nature of our relationship with others. Secondly, I want to emphasize with all of my uh, friends of other religious traditions who have spoken on this point, that the single moral ethical value that expresses the very nature of this ultimate reality, if we profess the alignment of our lives with what is ultimate, then it finds expression in what we speak of in Sanskrit as daya, and which many people have spoken here about as compassion. Compassion is the ultimate expression of a life that is aligned 
with ultimate reality. The, the word for compassion, as I said, is daya, D-A-Y-A in Sanskrit. The, the root is da, which is also the root of the word that means to control oneself, to be free from greed, and also the root of dhanam, da, which is to be generous. Mm -hmm. So compassion implies self-control. It implies generosity <laughs> towards other, the T.S. Eliot in his famous <laughs> poem, The Wasteland, he ended with this da, da, da. He drew from the Hindu text to speak of the necessity in the world for an ethic of self-control, of generosity, and of compassion that restores the wasteland, that brings new life again to this wasteland. So the Hindu tradition commends the human being who is devoted uh, to the flourishing of all, who identifies with others in suffering and uh, in, in joy. In his address to participants at the International Forum on Migration, Pope Francis uh, spoke of the necessity for solidarity, uh, which he defined as, and I quote, the capacity to understand the needs of our brothers and sisters who are in difficulty and to take responsibility for these needs. And so I think at the heart of the Hindu tradition is what I would speak of as a fundamental humanism that flows from this vision of seeing oneself in others. And one of the, the great Hindu teachers, uh, saintly poets of the tradition, Tulsidas, he says uh, in, in one of his often quoted verses, Daya dharma ka mula hai that the root of virtue is compassion. They are papa mula abhiman, and the root of evil is selfishness. He spoke of compassion in very famous words, para dukha dukha, sukha sukha. The ability to, to, be, to suffer when another suffers, the ability to smile when another smiles, is his uh, definition of compassion. Para dukha dukha, sukha sukha. When another smiles, you smile. When another is sad, you identify with that sadness. My third point. I think in the Hindu tradition, the expression of this humanism in the public sphere is the attentiveness to what we have spoken here about as the universal common good. But it has this idea of a universal common good has a very ancient history in the Hindu tradition the, the Bhagavad Gita, at least uh, 250 BC, uh, speaks of this common good in, with the use of the word loka sangraha. It is repeated in the text. And the text implores us that to think or to consider loka sangraha in everything that we do, in all decisions. Loka is inclusive. It's the human world, but it's the entirety of existence. So one has to have a vision of the universal common good in everything that one, uh, one, one does. It is what distinguishes the wise person, the unselfish wise person from the one who is unwise and who is uh, selfish. So the Hindu tradition, I would say, requires that we make the common good the purpose, not only of our individual lives, but also of the purpose of public policy. Uh, human beings do not flourish when they are victims of injustice and violence, when they lack opportunities to attain life's necessities that include health care, housing, education, good work, and leisure. Which brings me to my fourth point. And again, I come back to uh, the address of uh, Pope Francis because I think in this address he really uh, was able to identify certain shared moral values that link all of our traditions. And uh, in that same address, he spoke of hospitality. And he called it a sacred value, the sacred value of hospitality present in our religious traditions. And he went on to say, speak of hospitality to the stranger, in his words, as hospitality uh, to God. This is very fundamental. Um, his lifting up of hospitality 
um, it, it, uh, urged me also to look into my own tradition to see if there was anything that echoed uh, his own commend, commending of hospitality. And I found uh, in our most ancient text, the Vedas, a very powerful teaching where the, the, the teacher there advised his students in these words, may you become one for whom the stranger, teacher says, may you become one for whom the stranger is a, I'm going to introduce, use a Sanskrit word, is a deva, D-E-V-A, deva. It's a Sanskrit root uh, that is the same for the English word divine. It comes from, from Sanskrit deva, div. Now, uh, in, in the Hindu tradition, we use the word deva for God, but it depends on context. The word deva also means a person who is deserving of welcome, of reverence, of respect, of generosity. So a, a deva is someone who is accorded hospitality and received with, with gifts. So in this uh, Sanskrit uh, line, uh, the Sanskrit is atithi devo bhava. So the word for stranger that I, the word that I translate as stranger in Sanskrit is a titi. In Sanskrit, the a is a negative prefix. So titi is an appointment. So atithi means the person you encounter with whom you never had an appointment before. The unexpected arrival, the unplanned, the one who comes to you unplanned, unexpected, at your door is called atithi. So atithi devo bhava, may you regard such a person as a deva, as deserving of your hospitality, respect, generosity, uh, gifts. So it, you know, again, it describes well the refugee who is forced to flee her home, who arrives in desperation at our borders. And by speaking of such a person as a deva, the Veda is reminding us, I think, of our moral obligations to treat such persons as all of us agree with reverence, respect, generosity. And atiti is not qualified in any way. It's just atiti. The one who comes unexpectedly, there's no qualification of religion, ethnicity, origin, age, gender. It's just the unexpected person at your at your door. And my final point uh, is that, again, reiterating, but this in, in the distinctive Hindu um, place of meaning, in many of our traditions, the universe is a living entity, a living, breathing entity. In fact, in some of the great traditions of of, of, the, of Hinduism, the world is described as the body of God. <coughs> Existing within God, pervaded by God. It is not ours to own, to possess. The resources are meant for the flourishing of all beings. And one very famous text says that the earth should be Enjoy, te, te te na bunjita. enjoy the resources of the earth, but only after giving. Enjoy only after sharing with others. By giving you, you can, you can uh, enjoy. So that I think uh, Hindu economic thinking must be shaped by such values, by the values of generosity, non-possessiveness, concern for others, the common uh, good. And such values are not consistent with what we have spoken of throughout these two days. Uh, the situation where a tiny minority controls the, the, the resources and the wealth of our world, leaving over 800 million people in, in poverty. Where our challenge is is to translate uh, such moral values into public policy so that they become the norms, not only for individual relationships, but for building those structures of generosity, um, those structures of non-possessiveness 
that can transform our world. Uh, Gandhi, who has already been cited, uh, spoke so often about the importance of, or the necessity for economics to be informed by ethics. True economics, he said, in his view, is promote social justice, the good of all, especially the weakest among us. And he, he had this idea of trusteeship that he spoke often about, that the, the resources of the earth does not belong to anyone. We are all trustees of this, of this well, trustees of it for the, common, for the common good. And this is where it has to be truly applied. So let me conclude by simply reiterating that a single universal source of all life, of all existence, whatever name we use um, to speak of it. We have an ancient text in the Hindu tradition that says, ekam sat bahuda vipra, vipra bahuda vadanti, that one, one being we speak of in many ways, we call by many names. But this one being implies a universal moral concern. If we, if we seriously speak about single source of the universe, we cannot but have universal ethics, a universal moral uh, concern, which excludes no one. No one is privileged ethically or, or morally. And so, so today when we've s we see a narrow national and economic concerns again asserting and privileging themselves in our, in our world, I think together the moral consensus that we have affirmed in this meeting we have an obligation to speak in a powerful vo in with powerful voices, but with united voices against uh, such narrow assertion of national self-interest. We have to speak for the universal uh, common good. This is our obligation together as people coming from places of ultimate uh, meaning. Uh, we are responsible to speak for all, and especially for those who, who suffer, and for the, the poor, and for the marginalized. We end every Hindu prayer with the words, Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu. May the world be happy. May the world be free from suffering. We have to translate that into action. And I conclude with, with that word.